used a phrase a couple of years ago with somebody and I was like, here at Mountain View, we're kind of like refreshingly unprofessional to some degree because we're willing to roll with things and try stuff that's not normal because this is honestly, church is a community, it's a family. And so it's not an organization that you're showing up at today. You've walked into a local family of Jesus followers. So <laughs> whether you're new here or whether you're just passing through here, uh, welcome to the family for the day, and this is just a little taste of some of the variety of what we have here in our family. So whether it's people leading in prayer and music or serving with the kids or kids randomly coming up on stages and having kids church lessons in the middle of the sermon, that's kind of what we do here sometimes. So, so welcome. So we talked about a question. Um, you can go to the next slide if you want. We'll get off the seasons for a second. Uh, we talked about a question, the first question last week that we delved into was uh, with, with regard to those things I just mentioned with the kids. You know, Jesus said, there's a day coming when my followers, they're going to be persecuted and chased out of town and, and even killed or arrested. And there's a day coming when, uh, you know, this building, this temple that you see in Jerusalem, it's going to be ripped apart stone from stone. But there's also a day coming when the hearts of the people and the leaders in Jerusalem are going to change. They're going to be ready to celebrate me when I come back, but I won't come back until then. And his followers, afterwards, they went across Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives, which they would go often. You know, they were there the night before Jesus' crucifixion. They were there praying for a while at night when Jesus was arrested. And so his followers were just having a conversation like they probably often did on the Mount of Olives, you know, under the trees. And they said, when's this going to happen? And as I mentioned with the, this, the kids a minute ago, Jesus didn't give them a direct answer. And we haven't heard all of Jesus' answer yet because there's more, Matthew records more. But the first part of what he said was these cycles of the way humans have always been treating each other, they're going to keep happening for a while. But there's going to be a time when this is going to come to an end and these cycles are going to be completed. And I've got something beyond this and there won't be the types of suffering and pain that used to happen. But he didn't get into specifics. But they also asked Jesus a second question. And that's the question we're going to look at today and it's what's on the screen right now. Um, the second question is, what is the sign of your coming? And I think they were saying of your coming again to the temple. When you're going to come back and the leaders and the people in Jerusalem, instead of eventually killing you in a couple days, they're actually going to celebrate you and recognize you for who you are. And his followers believed that he was the Messiah, the promised deliverer, Emmanuel, God with us, this ultimate king who was going to live the life that no human had been able to live so far, uh, the life of what an image of God should really be like and who is even more than that, but God himself, God become human. And so they said, what's going to be the sign of that when people's hearts are going to change and you're going to come back again? And of the final completion, like of the age, when these cycles, these human cycles we just talked about, finally come to an end. And Jesus says this next. He says, logically, this is, so this is my, like, I put a couple of translation words in here because the English translations don't capture the humor of this, I don't think, fully. But what Jesus says is, logically, when you perhaps, so perhaps you'll see this thing and perhaps you won't, because perhaps it'll be beyond your lifetime, but logically, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, sure, of course, yeah, that abomination of desolation thing, how many of you know what in the world Jesus is talking about? <laughs> Whenever that abomination of desolation thing happens, that's when I'm coming back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what is Jesus talking about? And depending on your tradition that you were raised in, maybe some of you have religious background and your specific religious tradition, they taught you, you know, what that is. And maybe it's accurate. Maybe it's not. Maybe you're basing it on your personal study that you've done or what someone else has told you. And maybe you're looking at it going, I don't know. What in the world is that talking about? Um, Jesus says it came from Daniel, the prophet in the Old Testament. So I want to take us on a, a journey for a moment, a picture journey through Daniel. Because in order to have a good perspective on this and to understand it better, we need to understand Daniel, which is a near impossible thing for us to do. So I want to have a conversation with you. This is not a three-point sermon. This is a conversation with pictures to look at. And it's a conversation that weirdly mostly is about Daniel's dreams that he has. The book of Daniel is a collection of some narrative stories about Daniel's life and then several crazy dreams that God gave him some of which God clarified by sending angelic messengers to interpret parts of it, and some which God just left completely open. 
And all these things cause us a lot of confusion when we try to step back into this world. Because at this point in time, Jews had different ideas about what Daniel's prophecies were talking about. Let alone us, 2,000 years forward from that. How many of you are Jewish here uh, by heritage, nationality, or ethnicity? Any people who are Jewish here today? Okay. Um, not necessarily in the crowd. Some of you are. Uh, maybe you're listening online and you are. So you were brought up in maybe synagogue and studying the Torah, the Hebrew Bible a lot. But for most of us, we don't have a lot of background there. So we need to get just a little bit. Otherwise, who knows what this means, you know. So we're going to jump into Daniel a little bit today and try to get a little, little more information and maybe a little more confused in the process as well. But I want to give you a quick summary. I don't want to take too long, but we need to cover a couple basics. So here's, uh, here's Daniel in a nutshell. First of all, it is some weird dreams. There are some very difficult things to translate because not all of it was written in Hebrew. Some of it was written in Aramaic, which is like a, kind of like a Persian language that also became used in Israel and spoken in the time of Jesus where he lived. Um, it's also got some things that could be taken literally or symbolically. There are some numbers that appear over and over and over again in the Bible. And perhaps when Daniel sees these numbers or an angel delivers information about these numbers, perhaps they're literal numbers and years. And perhaps they're symbolic because other places in the Hebrew Bible, they're symbolic. And so these are some very puzzling things that we come to. But the context of them is dreams. Second thing I want you to pay attention to is the word desolate because you're going to see it come up. And I want you to get a flavor for the context because Jesus used that sign, the abomination of desolation. And so when desolation is used by Daniel, a lot of times it refers to something kind of similar, a similar group of things. So I want you to kind of file that in the back of your mind as well. So here's a little background, whirlwind tour of Daniel. Daniel, he was a youth, he was in the royal family in Judah, and then all of a sudden the empire of Babylon came in and completely ransacked uh, Jerusalem. They took some people with them and said, you know, we're going to put our own king here, and if he bucks the system, then we're going to come back and totally destroy your city, which eventually happened. But in that first raid, Daniel, along with some of the other royal youth, people in the royal family, was taken captive and taken back to Babylon back in the east. And he was asked by the king, by Nebuchadnezzar, a famous king of Babylon, uh, of Neo-Babylon, to eat some foods that were forbidden to Jewish people. And instead, he and his friends chose to eat seed-bearing plants, which is what Adam and Eve uh, first ate in the Garden of Eden. Um, so they're kind of like going back to Eden in a way and being the image of God that people were kind of supposed to. And then it says that God gave them knowledge and wisdom. So they're wise people. And they didn't choose to define knowledge and wisdom on their own like Adam and Eve did by seizing that fruit. They didn't take that. They learned it from God and allowed God to teach them about wisdom and knowledge. And so things are tracking in the right way. Daniel's a great example so far. And then he starts to have some crazy dreams. And here's the first one. Uh, actually, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. And Daniel... Um, he tells him what the dream is. God reveals that, and Daniel gives an interpretation. And it's a dream about a statue. The statue has a head of gold, has like a chest of silver, has a, like a, an abdomen of bronze, and its legs are made out of iron. And then it's got some feet and toes that are iron and clay mixed together, and they're not quite holding together really well. And those things, um, eventually, that statue is representative of kingdoms, different kingdoms that are going to come along. Of the head of gold uh, ends up becoming symbolic of uh, Babylon, kingdom of Babylon. And then the silver upper body of Persia, the Medo-Persian Empire. Then the bronze midsection of the Greeks. And then finally, the legs of iron of Rome. And how uh, at the end of this dream, the God of heavens will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed that's eventually going to bring all those other kingdoms in the statue to an end. That's dream number one about all these different kingdoms that he sees as a statue. So that's kind of the context. Daniel's getting information about different world empires that are coming along. The next Daniel has a strange dream. I don't have a picture for this one. You can, hold up, you can set on, just hold on this one for a moment. His next dream is about King Nebuchadnezzar turning into a beast, uh, going crazy, growing long hair and long nails that look like eagle claws and eagle fur or feathers and living out in a field eating grass. And then according to the narrative, for a period of time, King Nebuchadnezzar, he gets really prideful and God actually causes him to go insane for a brief period of time and he does that and then he realizes what he's done and comes back. Now that's not in Babylonian history, but Dana records that in the narrative as well. And the next dream he has, you can go to the next slide, it's about these four mutant beasts 
who he's later told represent, again, four empires, kind of similar to the statue. Um, they come up out of this sea, which kind of represents chaos. First is a lion with eagle's wings that gets ripped off, and then the lion receives the mind of a human again. And this seems to be talking again about Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, because he's the guy that you know, ends up looking like an eagle, living out in the field, and then the mind of a human kind of returns to him. He gets his senses back. And then the next picture of, is of this lopsided bear. And after that, there's the leopard, which I gave the kids a coloring sheet of, that has bird wings and four heads. And then there's a monster, finally, with iron teeth and ten horns. And Daniel is told these ten horns represent kings. One of these horns has human eyes and has an arrogant mouth that starts boasting about things. And then he finally sees God arrive, and God shows up in his royal chariot. And they have a little council, and these beasts meet their end, ultimately. And then somebody who looks like a human steps up into that chariot right alongside God. It's got two thrones in the chariot, and he takes a seat on that other throne, and then he gets a kingdom that lasts forever. And so all of these interesting things, he becomes ruler forever. Some more vague dreams that seem to follow the same pattern of these different world empires. Then he has another dream. Go to the next slide here. We're going somewhere here. He has another dream about a ram. It's got uh, a big horn and a smaller horn. And David is told after this dream, or Daniel's told after this dream, that that ram is going to represent uh, the Persian Empire. And then there's this one-horned goat that comes over and knocks the ram down and then tramples it. And Daniel's told later on that's going to represent the empire of Greece. And then that goat who defeats the ram, his horn cracks, and then four other little horns sprout up in their place. And you're like, this is just weird. This just keeps getting more and more odd. And it seems as though looking at history, if that's representative of Greece... The big horn is perhaps Alexander the Great. The smaller horns, a lot of scholars believe, are the four different smaller empires that emerged out of Greece, the Egyptian Empire, the Syria and Mesopotamian Empire, the Turkish Empire, and the Greek Empire that divided off from that. And so this just, again, keeps getting more and more weird, right? But we need to figure out what this abomination of desolation could possibly be. That's the only reason we're going here. And I want to also let you know how confusing this is. Because a lot of people come to these passages that Jesus says and they're like, this could not be more clear. This is exactly what Jesus means. Like, this is the, like how can you not see it? And the reason why you can't clearly see it is because where this imagery comes from is the strange mind of Daniel's dreams. Okay? And it's a lot more difficult. So when you have people that differ on interpretations of these things, um, take it with a grain of salt. Because your opinions and your viewpoints might be accurate, but know that there's a lot of different interpretation because there's a lot of confusing things that are based on Daniel's dreams that drive how you would even begin to interpret some of the things that Jesus says. And we'll kind of come out on the other side with you know, what we make of this and where Jesus goes with the conversation next week. But again, we're just getting a little background right now. In Daniel's dream, this goes on, and he says, from one of these four horns, so the offshoot of the Greek empire, which was explained to him by a heavenly messenger, a little horn emerged, and it grew extensively in different directions toward the promised land. It grew up into the heavens, even up into the stars. So it seems like it's pretty arrogant, pretty boastful. It acted arrogantly, even against the prince of the heavenly army. It revoked the regular sacrifice, and this is talking about the temple sacrifice in Jerusalem, and overthrew the place of God's sanctuary. In the rebellion, the army was given up together with the regular sacrifice. And so something that came out of the Greek empire eventually would take away the sacrifices in Jerusalem, would cause some sort of a rebellion, and the army of Israel would be defeated in this rebellion. It says the horn threw truth to the ground and was successful in what it did. And horns usually represent some king or some ruler. So some ruler that came out of the four different branches of the Greek empire um, was going to wreak havoc on the temple and do away with truth, throw it to the ground, and be successful. And then someone else in the next dream came along and said, how long is that going to happen? 
How long will this rebellion that makes desolate, that ruins, there's our key word, right? How long is it going to last? And the voice on the other end of the dream said, uh, 2,300 evenings and mornings, so three and a half years. And then the sanctuary, the temple, is going to be restored. What's interesting is as we track forward in history from the time of Daniel, which is, you know, 500s B.C., we track forward into the Greek Empire and how things play out. A few hundred years later, uh, from one of these four branches of the Greek Empire, there was actually a leader. His name was Antiochus, and he eventually came and he attacked the Promised Land of Israel. This is what a uh, Diodorus, he was a Greek historian from that time period, this is what he wrote about Antiochus. He said, Antiochus sacrificed a great pig at the image of Moses and at the altar of God that stood in the outer court of the temple. So he comes in, you know, uh, perhaps in the late second century BC, and he conquers Israel for a period of time. And if you know anything about Jewish people and uh, kosher rules, pigs are about as unclean as it gets. And so this guy comes in and he takes a fat pig, not a small one, but a huge one. And he takes it into the temple courts and sacrifices it on the altar of sacrifice and defiles it. And he sprinkles the blood of the pigs on the, it seems like, the altar and perhaps also on the priests and the representatives of the people there. He commands that the books that they were taught um, should be sprinkled with the broth made out of the swine's flesh. So he takes pig juice and he sprinkles it on all their holy books. And then he goes into the, like, starts to go in the temple structure in the buildings. And there's this lamp. It's the menorah. And it's supposed to stay burning all the time because it represents the immortal God. And he puts out the flames in the menorah. He's saying, like, I just took out the immortal God, basically, is what he's doing. Um, lastly, he forced the high priest and the other Jews to eat pig flesh. And he camped out in Jerusalem for three and a half years, historically. So it seems like some of Daniel's dreams are anchored in truth and what's actually going to happen. But that event is called a rebellion that makes desolate. Because the Jewish people put up a fight, you know. But this person, Antiochus, a Greek ruler, a Seleucid ruler, he was the Greek branch that was over Syria and Mesopotamia, came in and just wrecked havoc. If you know anything about uh, Jewish history, like B.C., the Maccabean Revolt happened as a result of that. So uh, the high priest gathered some uh, people who were committed to the Jewish way of life together, and eventually they led a rebellion and, and defeated Antiochus. And eventually Antiochus met his death. But for three and a half years, he made the temple area in Jerusalem desolate. So that was an example of this desolation. And by this time, all the dreams that Daniel has been having it says they're taking a toll on him. He's sick. He's exhausted. He has insomnia. He's afraid. He can't eat. He's trying to stay focused on his work as an advisor to the king, and it's just not going well because he's so disturbed by all these dreams, some of which he knows a little piece of what supposedly they mean, and other ones, they're just open-ended. But he keeps having these nightmares, and they keep taking their toll, especially about this one who's going to come and you know take out uh, the temple area, who, you know, I believe, again, historically was probably fulfilled in Antioch's Epiphanies uh, a couple hundred years later. And then we come into Daniel 9, and we've got the background of these dreams, different empires that are going to come and go in history and are going to try to stand up against God, and some rulers that are even going to make their way into Jerusalem and desolate things. And this is what chapter 9 says. We're going to walk through that, and then we're going to be done with our conversation today and uh, pick it up with more of a, a typical you know, sermon discussion style thing next week. Daniel 9, it says, In the first year of Darius, one of the Persian kings that Daniel was serving uh, with, in the first year of his reign, Daniel says, um, I understood from the books, according to the word of the Lord, from the prophet Jeremiah, that the number of years for the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70. So here's the word desolation again. And here's the background on that. When Babylon came through and ransacked Jerusalem in the time of Daniel, and Daniel was carted off to Babylon during the beginning of that, Daniel grew up. Not only grew up, but became an old man. And about 70 years later, he remembered that the prophet Jeremiah had heard that that time in Babylon would only last about 70 years. And so probably in his early 80s, Daniel started to get really excited 
And he said, I remember it was only going to be 70 years. And then, like, God was going to bring about something great. You know, we're going to come back into our homeland, back to Jerusalem, and things are going to get good again. And so he starts praying. And he prays prayers of confession. God, we're so sorry we mistreated you. We realized the reason why we ended up here in the first place was because we ignored you for about 500 years and did what we wanted. And so, you know, we didn't follow you. And so you allowed us to get in this position, but you're going to have grace and you're going to restore us and bring us back. And Jerusalem's only going to be desolate for 70 years. And then something good's going to happen. And so desolation, it, it was connected with the temple being desecrated. It was connected with Jerusalem being besieged and overthrown by Babylon. So those are a couple of connections with desolation. It's the idea of being ruined, of being uninhabited, being laid to waste, being destroyed and broken apart. That's the idea. So he says, you know, I started seeking the Lord and praying to him. Um, he says, may the, your face, as part of his prayer, shine on your desolate sanctuary for the Lord's sake. Because they also ripped the temple apart before they deported them to Babylon finally. And so the temple was destroyed for the first time. They had to rebuild it again. Jesus, when he lives, it's at that second rebuilt temple structure in Jerusalem. And so, so now it's connected with the temple itself being destroyed and broken apart. There's three different little connections for the word desolate. It relates to the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem and the, uh, just something utterly disgusting happening at the place where God's supposed to be worshipped. All those ideas are swirling in the mix and he says, while I was praying and confessing my sin and putting my petitions before the Lord, um, Gabriel, the man, seems like some heavenly being that comes to give interpretation to, to these dreams. Uh, we might say an angel reached me about the time of the evening offering, the time when they would be doing the evening sacrifice because they weren't because the temple was currently destroyed. He says, he gave me this explanation. He says, Daniel, I've come to give you some understanding. And as we walk into this, we think, oh, understanding. I feel like I have more questions and answers now than ever. He says, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to bring your rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to atone for sin, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to complete vision and proper, uh, prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. So you're thinking, okay, 70 weeks. What is he talking about here? And this is another place where people diverge in their interpretations. It seems like from the following conversation, what he says next, that these weeks probably are 77s is how it's literally expressed in Hebrew. It seems like those 77s are uh, 70 groups of seven years, 490 years, it seems like from the next explanation that comes up to take place. So Daniel, you thought things were going to get good now. Try waiting another 490 years then things might start to get good. I mean, think about that. It's Christmas Eve, and you're 10 years old, and you wake up on Christmas morning, and someone tells you, you can have your presents when you turn 89. <laughs> so disappointing, right? So disappointing. He's saying there's going to be a longer period of time. And whether those years are literal or whether they're symbolic, because sevens were numbers that were repeated a lot, 70 was repeated a lot symbolically in the Bible, it's going to be a very long time till sin is stopped and atoned for and God's right way of living is brought in and some of these prophecies come to fulfillment. It's going to be a long time, Daniel. And he says, no one understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. So it's going to happen. Uh, someone's going to decree that, that you can go back to Jerusalem and soon and start to rebuild it. So you are right in what you're praying for and that 70 years is about up. But from that time... There's going to be another seven weeks of years and another 62 weeks of years, 483 more years. And after that happens, the Messiah will be caught off. That's interesting. It tells them, you know, almost 500 years later, if it's literal, the anointed one, the Messiah that you've been waiting for, it's going to be cut off. Cut off is a way, it's a nice way of saying killed. And we'll have nothing. Then he says the people of the coming ruler, they're going to destroy the city and the, the temple. The people of the coming ruler. That's clear. How many rulers have we heard about? How many peoples have we heard about? We have a statue that's four different empires. Each of those empires has multiple rulers. And then the statue has ten toes, which represent more rulers. We have uh, different beasts that come out that represent empires. And each of those empires have multiple rulers. And the final beast has ten horns on its head. And those represent foreseeably rulers of some sort. 
And so are those rulers in the past, are those rulers in the present, are those rulers in the future? We don't get a lot of detail out of it, and that's why it's confusing to understand some of these things. But he says the people of this coming ruler, whoever it is, they're going to destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with a flood. Until the end, there's going to be war. And then he says, there's that key word again, desolations are decreed. So if it's anything to do with what it's been uh, related to previously, it has something to do that's not good with Jerusalem, not good with the temple, and not good with the worship system in the temple. There's going to be problems, right? So some sort of desolation, a people of some coming ruler are going to destroy the city and the sanctuary. But he says, after the anointed one is cut off. So it seems like maybe it's not Antiochus, who was still a couple hundred years before the time of Jesus, and only a couple hundred years into 483 years, you know? So maybe this is someone in the future. And maybe this somehow relates to the conversation Jesus has been having about the stones of the temple being ripped apart one by one. Jesus is saying the temple, from his point in time to his followers, you know, he's connecting it somehow back with this chapter when there's going to be another ruler who's going to destroy the city and the sanctuary again. We talked about patterns and cycles. And even what happens to the worship center in Jerusalem, it seems like it's going to become a cycle. You know, the time that it was destroyed by Babylon was only the first. And it's going to happen again. And maybe it's going to happen again and again. We don't know. He also gives a little more information. It says he, and the he here could refer to the people previously or to the ruler that it talked about in the last couple of verses. So either the people or the ruler will make a covenant with many people for one week. Some kind of an agreement of some sort. And if the week represents years, for seven years. If it's symbolic, for a period of time. But in the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to sacrifice and offering. So this coming ruler is going to pull the same play that Antiochus pulled, apparently. Going to try to do the same thing. Because he's going to bring some sort of desolation, apparently. Put a stop to sacrifice and offering again. And he says, this translation says, and the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple. Hebrew doesn't actually say the temple. They filled that in for interpretation's sake. Might be accurate, might not. But the abomination of desolation, that's Jesus' phrase, right? Will be on a wing of the temple until the decreed destruction is poured out on the one who brings the destruction. So this is, again, kind of vague. But this is the territory and the context of what Jesus is talking about with his followers on the Mount of Olives. And I'm sure their minds are a little bit blown when Jesus refers to this as well because there's so much room even for Jews at the time for understanding and interpretation. But it seems to have something to do with Jerusalem and the temple being laid waste. If you read that last phrase, uh, the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple until the decreed destruction is poured out on the desolator. That's our English translation. If you were to take a more literal translation of the Hebrew, here's what you would end up with. The horror causer, like horror as in horror film, right? The causer, the one who causes horror or dread or fear, will be upon a wing, or that word can also mean an extremity, like an outer area of something, of detestable things. So the horror causer will be upon a wing of detestable things until a decreed completion is poured out on the causer of the ruin. Which sounds even more confusing. The only reason I point that out, though, is that this word abomination, it literally means the horror causer. So I don't know that the abomination of desolation is a thing. It sounds more like a person. A person who causes some sort of horror. That's this abomination of desolation. Just like what Babylon did to Jerusalem was a horror, a shock to everybody living there. Just like what Antiochus did was a complete shock to the people of Jerusalem when they were forced to eat pig flesh and when a pig was sacrificed on their altar, when a pig's, pig's blood was sprinkled over everything and when the immortal uh, menorah was extinguished. That was a horror. There's going to be another horror causer to come in the future. And that seems to be what Jesus is referring to. And so we'll get into more conversations about who, what, when, what that sign could refer to next week. But you've got to know the background and how crazy this is. One, uh, because we need to know it to try to get 
possible meanings out of what Jesus says, but also so that we can have empathy with other people who think differently, because this is not a clear thing for multiple reasons. And it's something that people in uh, different Christian traditions have explained in at least four different ways for a couple of thousands of years. So as we work through this, uh, I want you to feel like you have room, maybe to have different thoughts and different interpretations, and for all of us to come together at the end of the day and say, maybe we don't have this right, or maybe we do, or maybe we won't know, but something not good related to the place of Jerusalem and the temple Jesus is speaking about something not good. And when this thing, this horror causer arrives, Jesus says, you'll know. That's part of the answer to your question. It's going to be a sign to you.